In this lecture, I want to talk about another philosophical application of predicate logic. So, logic in general, and predicate logic in particular, is at the foundations of contemporary mathematics. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons why our logical system was developed in the first place is because people had aspirations to attempt to reduce mathematics to self-evident logical truths. Nowadays, many philosophers have given up on that program. If you have a sufficiently robust notion of what it would be to reduce mathematics to logic, then one can in fact prove that that can't be done. Nevertheless, there is an interesting and intimate relationship between logic and mathematics. And I just want to give us a glimpse of that relationship here. There's an interesting relationship between quantification, identity, and counting. So we've already seen that there exists an x such that x is f means there is at least one f. And now that we have the identity symbol, we also have a way of saying there is exactly one f. We can say that as follows. There is an x such that x is f, and for any y, if y is f, then y is identical to x. I think a little reflection reveals that this statement is equivalent to the claim that there is exactly one f. There exists an x such that x is f, tells us that there's one thing that's f, there's at least one thing that's f, and then the rest of this clause says that for anything else at all, or for anything at all, if that thing is f, then it's identical to the one thing that we already said is f. So that's equivalent to the claim that there is exactly one f. We can also say, using the identity sign, that there are at least two f's. We can say that as follows. There exists an x and there exists a y such that x is f and y is f and it's not the case that x is identical to y. I think it is apparent that this tells us that there are at least two f's because it tells us that there's something x that's f and something y that's f and those things are distinct. They're not the same thing so there are at least two things that are f. We can also, if we want, say not only say there are at least two f's, we can say there are exactly two f's in our system. We can do that as follows. There exists an x and there exists a y such that x is f and y is f and it's not the case that x is identical to y and for any z, if z is f, then z is either identical to x or z is identical to y. I think a little reflection tells us that this is equivalent to the claim that there are exactly two f's. All right, let's look at the claim that there are at least three f's. We can represent that claim as follows. There exists an x and there exists a y and there exists a z such that x is f and y is f and z is f and it's not the case that x equals y and it's not the case that x equals z and it's not the case that y equals z. Look at this for a little while and convince yourself that this is in fact equivalent to the claim that there are at least three f's. And continuing with the pattern that we've developed so far we can also say that there are exactly three f's as follows. It is a mouthful, but we can say it. There exists an x, and there exists a y, and there exists a z, such that x is f, and y is f, and z is f, and it's not the case that x is identical to y, and it's not the case that x is identical to z, and it's not the case that y is identical to z, and furthermore, for any v, if f, if v is f, then v is either identical to x, or v is identical to y, or v is identical to z. This tells us that there are exactly 
three Fs. Now it's apparent that we could replicate this same pattern for any number we want. You can see that as we increase the number, things get ridiculously more complicated, but in principle, this could be done. So we can re represent a lot of numerical sentences in predicate logic, and we can represent inferences involving those sentences in predicate logic, and in your homework, I have you do a couple of problems that involve the representation of such inferences.